chapter 9, starting in verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it to the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. And others said, No, he was only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They demanded. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to, to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought, to the, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees asked him how he had received the sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such marvelous signs? So they were divided. And finally they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not, did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was blind, was born blind. But how he can now uh, see, how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, and he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why the parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man had been given who was blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did you do, what did he do to you, and how did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you do not listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are the fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jim Smith is our speaker today. He's traveled here from Texas with his wife, Donna. She was our speaker yesterday at Ladies Day and uh, just continued to hear good things about the day yesterday and how much work was put in and how much good was accomplished. So um, we look forward to hearing Jim today. What a great story that is about that young man that uh, encountered so much in such a short period of time. 
but uh, Jim has worked with churches in New Hampshire, Illinois, and Texas. Uh, I would consider him a straight shooter from Texas. Is that fair? Okay. So uh, he said in class he was 62 years old. Uh, he was 62 years old. And then he clarified that was 13 years ago. So, Jim, we love it when you're here. Uh, Donna, so much appreciate your travels to be here. And we thank you for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mark. And it's always good uh, to be here with you and to be in your midst because you're a, you're, you're a loving people. And our, our t uh, topic this morning that we'll be talking about very simply is, is that people are worth it. People are worth it. Um, Vonda, where are you? I don't mean to, to uh, embarrass you or anything. But where are you, dear? We've been praying for you this morning. Oh, there she is, back here, back here. She's worth it. And that's why we prayed for her. Amen? Amen. 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 And so that's our topic. Or maybe we can look at our topic in another way. And very simply say, how do you view people? How do you view people? You know, as we begin to think about it, in, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, Jesus will say, for what will he profit a man if he gains the whole world? And yet he loses his own soul. You know, our soul was worth so much, isn't it? So greater. Uh, worth so much that Jesus would come and that he would die for us. And he would live so that you and I would know the Father. And that the love that they have, that we could share with each other. And that we could pray for Vonda this morning. Because why? She's worth it. And you know what? You're worth it too. You're worth it too. I don't know your name. I'm sure there's another Jim in the audience. Or two or three. But you're worth it. You're really worth it this morning. And so I want to ask you this morning, how do you view family what about people with whom you work or play or maybe your friends or strangers how do you view them when you look at them what do you really see well let me ask you another question what is the right way to view people how should I really look at people? As we think this morning, I want to challenge you to take the view of Jesus. But before we do, let's look at the way in which America uh, views people. We will either view them from the standpoint of their performance, what they can do, or maybe from the way in which they're attractive. How do we view them? Well, if we take it first of all from America's industry, we view people from the point of which that we can prosper the company. What will they be worth to the, pump, to the, the company? Um, what's their value in the marketplace? You know, as we begin to get older, we're less profitable to industry. Why? I can't bend like I used to. I can't run like I used to. And so, how do we really view people? Well, what about those who cannot perform? You know, I can remember little Jeremy. Jeremy had Down syndrome. And I remember at West Freeway, one of the guys that we really loved was Jeremy. Jeremy was probably about, I think, 18 years old. And you know what? Jeremy could go to any class he wanted to. He could be in the auditorium. He could be in the teen class, any adult class. He could even be in the 
class we're in that we have grade school children. Why? Because, see, Jeremy, to us, had great value. But to the world, to the industry world, they did not see him from that viewpoint. Well, what about in regard to America's entertainment? You know, it hadn't been too long that we had all these awards and they took uh, Los Angeles and they, they, the, the street there, they turned it into a, just a huge place where they're going to give away these big old, uh, what you call it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> you can see how much attention I paid to it. But I can remember going down the streets in Los Angeles. And I can remember as we was in one of the buildings there looking out and seeing the sign of Hollywood. How does Hollywood see people? You know the reason today that they're doing all these shots in order to take away the wrinkles and, and all that is because what's happened to us is that we have placed value in looks, in attractiveness. Well, I lost all my attractiveness, I'm sure, that, that, that drew my wife to me in the first place. Hello? <laughs> when I lost my hair. <laughs> you know, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy that we look and see how handsome people are? You know, she just has more face to kiss. Hello? Huh? Come on, y'all. Wake up with me. <laughs> it's, it's okay to talk to me, Waltz. <laughs> and so, so we see then that that's the way that Hollywood looks at people. And, and so the other day, one of the actors, what was, they, they showed her stomach. Why? Why do I want to see her belly button? Huh? Hello? Well, that's nonsense. Hello? Right? And we allow them to what? To pull us that way. How many of y'all had a facelift here lately? Yeah. The, doc, the doctor went in and he, see, he said to me, he said, Jim, he says, your eyes are drooping down. He said, pretty soon it's going to get to the point where you can't see because they've drooped down. So he said, I think you're going to have to have a facelift. So I can pull your eyelids up. You can see. I went home and told Donna. I said, hey. She said, what did you say? I said, the doctor said, I think it's going to have to have a facelift. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and so we let the world decide for us how we're going to view people. Well, Really, where should our response to people come from? And what is the value of a soul? How did Jesus view people? I want to say to you this morning, he, he viewed them in a different, uh, different way. Paul will tell us in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, we no longer look from the viewpoint of the flesh. But where? From the value of the soul. And so we can see then that as we will change our viewpoint toward people that we can see so many wonderful uh, blessings and opportunities. You see, God gave people opportunities for blessings if you and I will just view them in the right way. Well, let's begin to see how Jesus would view people from John chapter 9 and verses 1 through verse 34. In this story of the man that's been born blind, we will see at least five ways that you can see people, that you can look at them. We will notice that first of all, if you will look with me in verse 2, notice what the disciples will say. They will come and they will see the blind man that now he can see and they will say to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, 
You see, they did not really even see the needs of the man, did they? In fact, they didn't even see the man. All they saw was a religious question. That's all they saw. No, nothing else. But by raising this religious question, they would not have to deal with him. You see, they could detach themselves from him. And that's what happens to us someday. Sometimes what happens to us is if we can just talk about someone and bring them up in conversation and talk about them from a religious standpoint, then what we say is we have finished with them and we detach ourselves from them and we go home feeling good that we talked about them. Hello? And we never do anything about them. All we do is have a religious discussion and talk about them. Well, did you see, did you talk about old Joe? Well, yeah, we had a discussion about him. We, we talked about him and, and, and this question was brought up and from a religious, dis, uh, from a religious standpoint, we talked about him. Well, what did you do about him? Well, we talked about him. Huh? Isn't that right? As, as an elder. As an elder. Sometimes we would bring people up. Talk about them. And that was it. That was it. And we felt good. And we detached ourselves from it. Well, today, how do we see people? Is it only from the standpoint of religious question? Turn with me to verse 8. Look at verse 8. And let's see again now how that the neighbors saw him. What's the neighbors in verse 8? And they will say, and, and he's, as he's now seeing, and they will look and they will say, well, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Isn't this the beggar? And we will say as we look at people, well, is this not the prostitute? Well, isn't this the drunkard or the druggie or whatever? Hello? Isn't this the one that holds the, holds the signs up? The religious signs? Isn't this the one that leads the marches? And what do we do? And we put our label on them and we detach ourselves from them and we say we don't have a responsibility because why? We place the label on them. Do you ever do that? I do. I can remember in Granbury, there was a couple. They lived in, they felt like that they needed to live, live poor. In fact, they kind of lived out in the, in the forest. But they felt that, that God's job for them was that, that they would hold signs up. And it would be different signs and they would be in different places all over the city of Granbury. And I would pass by and pass by. And finally one day I, I said to myself, I said, I, I need to stop. Instead of just placing a label on these good people, I need to stop and I need to talk to them about Jesus. And I stopped. And I began to talk to them, or try to talk to them about Jesus Christ. But they wouldn't let me. And I thought about how so, so many times I'd passed them. And I'd, I'd put a label on them. Well, these are the people that hold up the signs. That's what we would always say. What, has anybody stopped? Well, no. But these are the people that hold up the signs. And so what we did is we cubby hold them 
and we released ourselves from the obligation of stopping and sharing and asking, are you okay? You need help? And so we can see then that sometimes we view people from a religious standpoint and we detach ourselves. Sometimes we put labels on them and we detach ourselves. Hello? Ever been there? Are you with me? You, I'm, I'm showing you me this morning. I'm talking to me and I'll allow you. So maybe if there's an application to you, then maybe see you. Look at verse 16. Here's the Pharisee's standpoint from which they would see the man. Notice in verse 16. As we look in verse 16, and they're seeing this man, and, and as they look at him, they're saying, well, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. In other words, they didn't look at the man, but they were looking at who? Somebody that they could condemn. That's what's happening to them. And so what they're saying is, this man here, we want to detach ourselves because you know what? If we bring this man in, we're going to cause what? A, a religious division amongst ourselves. We're going to cause a problem. Don't bring that, that lady in here. Because if you bring that lady in here, she's going to cause a problem. Hello? And so therefore, don't talk to her. And so as we look at this man, they're seeing him through the eyes of what Jesus did. Well, this man can't. This man, you can't bring him in here. And by the way, they would have been much happier if this man had still been blind. Hello? Huh? And sometimes when we bring people in and there's a little bit of disturbance or something, we just as soon as they'd been back out in the street away from us. Hello? Because they're causing problems. I never will forget the guy. He only stayed with us for a little while. But I can remember in Granbury and, and what he would do, he would always go to the left side of the pulpit. And sometimes during our service, what would happen is he'd come around, he'd come down the aisle and come over here, and what he would do is he would stoop down and he'd pray. The preacher was still preaching. Hello? Well, get that man out of here. Get that man out of here. Because all he's going to do is cause a problem amongst us. Kind of reminds me of the guy that came into the service. And he would always, when a preacher makes a good point, praise the Lord. Make a good point. Praise the Lord. Huh? Praise the Lord. Well, after a, a, a service of that, one of the elders, he, he eyed him, he took off, and he caught him. He said, look here, let me tell you something, buddy. I want you to know and understand, we don't praise the Lord here. <laughs> Hello. Isn't it something? How do we view people? Let me say to you, if you've had a bus ministry, if you've had a campaign, we're going to have some people that don't understand some of our traditions, right? Amen. <laughs> they don't understand some of them. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to be easy with them, help them. 
when it's only this tradition, then we're going to have to help them. And by the way, I'm going to have to help myself. <laughs> huh? Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and so sometimes there's going to be some disruption. Well, let's look and see how the parents saw him. Verse 20. Verse 20. As we look at verse 20, his parents will say, We know one thing, that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But what? Ask him, he's of age. <laughs> Sometimes when you and I look at people, we say, oh, that's just mom. That's just dad. Oh, that's just my wife. Don't pay any mind to it. Or, you know, and, and instead of taking the gospel, we say family cannot teach what? Don't say it with me. Family can't what? Teach family. And, and, and we got a, a word for that. Do y'all have a word for that? It's called baloney. Huh? Hello. Let's see, we view people, well, that's just my son-in-law. You know, <laughs> I used to tell Donna, and, and you know, before, and, you know, all, when, with, uh, now, you Y'all not going to send this down to Henderson, are you? I don't need my son-in-law to see this. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> I used to say, oh, that's just David. <laughs> huh? That's just David. But you know what? The old boy, he's done good. <laughs> he's done good. God has really taken him. And so how do we see people? Do we... See them in regard to sharing the gospel with them. Oh, that's just that's that's just my parents, and, and you can't teach family. Uh, how do we really view? And so, what we're doing there is we see them only from a biological standpoint. Enjoy. It. Jesus is hinting to us then that there is a new point of view that you and I can look at people. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 47 through verse 49, Jesus will say, here are my parents, the people that what? Hear my words. That was Jesus' viewpoint. Well, number five, let's look at the way Jesus really saw people. As he looks at the man, his disciples remember while asking who sinned, this man or his parents, Jesus will actually come back in verse 3 immediately and he will say here, what? But that the works of God should be revealed in him. How do you see him? He said, guys, you're asking the wrong questions. You're looking at this guy at the wrong view. You're looking at the outward view. And what you need to be doing is asking, what can God do? with this person. Aren't you glad? Aren't you really glad that somebody said, let's see what God can do in this good lady and in this good lady. And somebody never gave up on old Jim. They didn't give up on me. But they gave me opportunities. I think that every one of you have a story wherein that people did not give up on you, but they said, let's see what God can do with this guy. Did you lead singing when you was a small kid? Or was you bashful like me? Uh-huh, what? <laughs> yeah, bashful. Oh, I hated it. Huh, did you hate it? 
and they've tried to get me up front and try to get me to read a scripture or, or try to do me get prayer or try to get me to lead a song. That, by the way, I still can't lead a song. <laughs> and I didn't like it. But you know what? One day, there was a lady that come along in my life. She was patient with me. She knew where she wanted to take me. She knew what God could do with me. And she says, I'll take this old boy and I'll see what God can do with him. And she spoke to you ladies yesterday. And she talked to you yesterday about God's nursery. The lessons I'm doing for you this morning, the lessons she, was, she did for you yesterday, it's all about seeing what God can do. Amen. And he can take his beatitudes and if I'll just become poor in spirit, And understand that there is nothing within me. There's nothing in me. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. He says, I'm not of excellence of speech. And he'll say later on, he says, I'm even bad. To, I, I, I'm not very attractive. I'm not like the world sees. And he allowed God to do what? To take him and work with him and reshape his life. And then he began to see people in a different light. Hey, we've got to look in our neighborhood. And we can't allow religious questions to come up instead of seeing people. We can't allow labels to come up instead of seeing people and what God can do with them. We can't allow maybe a division that would come to, if we accept somebody in and help them. We can't allow all these things to block our view of what God can do with them. Hello? Anybody home? Yeah. You see, this lady didn't give up on you, did she? <laughs> How many years you been married? Fourteen. But she even took you after that, didn't she? <laughs> Mine's been with me 50 years. She didn't give up. 60? 60 years. 68. Bless her heart. <laughs> there you go. Do you hear him? He said if it hadn't been for her, he would not have been here. She didn't give up. Hey, are y'all with me? Babe, we're going to stop here. This babe up there, who's, who's running the show? <laughs> babe, we're going we're gonna to stop right here. Now, Will you look with me in the neighborhood, in your neighborhood, and in the neighborhood here? Will you look, and will we not see from the physical standpoint, 
but will we look and will we see what God can do? Will you? This morning, if you're in the audience and you think that everybody's given up on you, God's not given up on you. This morning, God wants to help you and he wants to give you hope and he wants to cleanse your heart. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to forgive you. And he went to the cross. Our Savior went to the cross that this morning you might be free and that you will have a family that will love you, that will bring you in, and they will be the best nursery as you become a child of God that you could ever have right here in this place. Amen? If there's anybody here this morning that's not a Christian, will you not help them? Hello? Will you not help them? You will. And so this morning, if you in any way need to respond, if you need to obey the gospel, be buried in baptism with Jesus, come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, and be cleansed. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. If this morning you've given up on yourself, You've been a Christian in the past, but you haven't lived that Christian life. And you want to come home. This is the place to come. Here's people that will love you, that will forgive you, and that will encourage you. And if you need to come home this morning, come. Come home with us. Be at home with us. It's together we stand and as we sing. Won't you come?